The F-16 is old. The original idea is roughly as old as I am, and I am 52. The original design is just a few years younger, and I wish I was aging as well as the F-16 is doing. Welcome to Millennium 7 Star, the channel that helps you make sense of military history and military technology. Please stay with me till the end, because the stuff that we discuss here are not easily found anywhere else on YouTube. The F-16 was the brainchild of a group of officers who, uh, building on the lessons of Vietnam and the EM theory of air combat developed by John Boyd, were sure that the Air Force needed a light fighter dedicated to air to air missions. They became known as the Fighter Mafia. Describing exactly why and how the United States Air Force reached the conclusion that they needed a fighter like the F 16 would require a couple of videos in itself. What matters most is that the idea behind the F 16 was that of a simple light fighter armed with short range weapons and capable of quick transients, that is, quick changes in speed, attitude and direction. The resulting YF-16 was very light, but it used the powerful F-100 engine of the F-15. It was exactly what the fighter mafia wanted, a simple Spartan plane with high thrust to weight ratio, dedicated to within visual range air-to-air -air combat. However, this was not going to last. Even the first production version was larger and 25% heavier than the original YF-16 because the European customers wanted the plane to be capable of a secondary air-to-ground mission and the United States Air Force could not afford another dedicated air-to-air -air combat plane after the F-15. More fuel, larger fuselage, more hard points, and a decent radar changed quite radically the nature of the plane. The fighter mafia was upset, but this change of tack made the fortune of the F-16. As of 2020, 29 countries use or have used it, and almost 4,600 units have been produced, of which around 3,000 are still in serve. But the F-16 holds probably another record, it has been probably the most customized and upgraded plane in history. Lockheed Martin has counted 139 versions and more than a thousand upgrades of all kinds. So the question is, why did it happen and what features made the platform so adaptable? The first obvious point to consider is just the sheer numbers of units built. The more you build something, the more you have ideas to improve it. Since the Air Force made the F-16 the low component of its mix of high-low fighters, uh, the high being the F-15, the sheer number of units produced was a guarantee of a constant stream of improvements being implemented. The customization that is always necessary for any specific Air Force also guaranteed that each different non-US version had some defects removed and some improvements added. After all, the F-16 is not the only example of this phenomenon. The MiG-21 has had a not much lower number of improvements and customizing, just because it has been produced in over 10,000 units and it has been used by dozens of our forces. The second and less obvious point to consider is that the F-16 dynamic performance is still current almost 50 years after the first flight. The F-16 was the first fighter designed after the rush for speed stopped in the late 60s, just above Mach 2 with the F-15. It was built to manage and retain energy while maneuvering at high roll and turn rates. Since it was designed to be light and cheap, it doesn't have a variable geometry wing, and the air intakes is a simple pitot intake, thus sacrificing some of the speed performance. However, the sacrifice was considered acceptable because the Vietnam experience demonstrated that short-range combat and dogfight was unavoidable, despite the air-to-air -air missile range. In those conditions, energy management and maneuverability are considered more important than pure speed. This has not changed over the years, and even more modern fighters have been designed for similar performances, even if they are achieved with 
different aerodynamic configurations. The only totally new dynamic requisite emerged in the 21st century is the supercruise, something that even the most recent Block 70 still can't do. However, any other F-16 dynamic performance is still adequate to this day. The plane empty weight has increased during the years uh, with a curious dip for the Block 30 because of various equipment has been added but the engine thrust has increased too. So the latest F-16 version have dynamic performances potentially even better than the early planes. In other words, the F-16 performance today is still adequate because the requirements of World Air Forces did not change much over the years. Even the modern European Delta Canards may have a speed or acceleration advantage, but they are only marginally better in terms of maneuverability. And they are deltas, so they are handled differently anyway. And if you ask why the F-16 has a conventional layout and not a Delta Canard, the answer is that at the time it wasn't yet clear the potential of a relaxed stability plane coupled with Delta and Canards. In fact, Every time an experimental program modified the X-16, either with canards or delta wings, there has been an improvement. However, this conducive environment would not have led to such a longevity if the design of the F-16 wasn't special in some way. Airframes are usually designed with a maximum load factor and a useful life in mind. The load factor is easy to understand, it is basically how many G's the plane can safely pull without going to pieces. The F-16 was designed for 9.4 G's, which is enough to kill a pilot if not used cautiously. It is not very difficult to design for that, you just need to size the structural components adequately. The useful life is more complicated. The useful life it is connected to a phenomenon known as metal fatigue. If an aircraft's structural component is exposed to periodic high loads, not enough to break it but not very far from the point of rupture, it can ultimately become incapable of bearing the loads and it will break even if the load is not as high as the design load. This is caused by micro cracks that are developed inside the metal, growing slowly till the point they become big enough to cause the rupture. It is not well known, but planes do fly with fatigue cracks if the amount and size of the cracks match the design expectation. Actual combat flights, where the pilots do not spare any roughness to the airframe, tend to age the structures very quickly because the high loads can cause a faster proliferation and a faster growth of the micro cracks. The original plane was designed for a useful life 4000 hours which is a relatively short lifespan and it was because of the deliberate choice to reduce some safety margins. This was compensated by an in-depth inspection every 500 hours to identify eventual unexpected problems. And indeed, problems were found and there have been various structural issues that require small redesigns, additional small structural parts and the early replacement of all the damaged elements. Classic problem, for example, was with the assembly that joined the wingtip rib with the wing spars. Originally designed to carry the sidewinder, which is about 90 kilos, it encountered problems when the sparrow was mounted at about 230 kilos. Uh, these elements crack quickly, and since the fuel is contained within the wing, when they broke, they caused dangerous fuel leaks. This is no surprise, but what was done differently with the F-16, though, was creating a comprehensive database of the structural problems that, during the years, allowed to massively improve the structural plane design. Newly built planes featured all the upgrades and they had their useful life extended to 8000 hours. The F-16B, the latest version, is expected to have an outstanding 12,000 hours useful life. Lockheed Martin has also designed the upgrade path from the previous Block 30, 40, 50 to the Block 70, so you may end up with basically a new plane, but don't expect the upgrade to be cheap and easy, it is still a big project.
The weapon's load and the avionics of the F-16V is generation ahead of the original F-16A. The systems have been upgraded several times during the years and the non-United States versions all have their own peculiarities. This flexibility did not just happen, it was actively built into the plane. The F-16 was designed with maintenance and upgrades in mind. There are a lot of panels that can be opened on the ground and most of them can be accessed without a ladder. This is probably no longer true for those planes that have extra equipment in the dorsal spine, uh, like the Israeli planes for example. Almost all the electronic was based on line replaceable units, that is, black boxes that could be easily disconnected from the plane and replaced. With the F-16, you don't need anymore to make a complex analysis on the plane electronics to understand what the problem was. You just replace as many boxes as necessary to restore the plane of functionality and then you send the plane back to the line. The lane replaceable units that have been replaced then can be repaired offline. Actually, in the original plane, there was also some spare room for the electronics, just to accommodate the improvements. All these landing replaceable units were connected with the flight computer by the standard MEL STD 1553 data bus, which simplified a lot the replacement and the upgrade. The architecture was so flexible as to allow for literally hundreds of different configurations, all progressively changing and improving over to the F-16V. The latest version has taken advantage of this approach to take the avionics to a point where it is perfectly aligned with more recent designs like European Deltas. The F-16V avionics features a lot of components like the APG-83 AISA multi-mode radar, which is an advanced AISA radar, upgraded modular mission computer and upgraded avionics architecture. By the way, it seems that the 1553 um, data bus has been replaced by the commercial Ethernet standard. Seems strange to me, but I give you the news as I have seen them. It has an infrared search and track. It features an advanced data link in addition to the traditional Link 16. It carries its own targeting pod. It has new cockpit displays and some safety improvements. It has a new digital flight control computer with enhanced autopilot and auto throttle. He has a digital intercommunication system with 3D audio and it features precision GPS navigation. And last but not least, an integrated electronic warfare suit featuring also Tau decoys. It is a good progress from the old NAPG-66 radar and nothing else. If you like this video, I'm sure you will like the videos that are going to appear beside me. In the meanwhile, please like, dislike, subscribe and hit the bell so you won't miss anything in the future. If you could consider supporting the channel on Patreon or Subscribestar, that would be amazing and you will have all my gratitude. In the meanwhile, thank you very very much for watching and see you in the next video.